Welcome to the webinar presentation on the clinical nurse leader role, past, present, and future. I'm Jennifer Stiles, Senior Marketing Manager for Nursing here at Jones & Bartlett Learning, and would like to introduce our presenters and authors, Drs. Linda Roussel and Tricia Thomas. Dr. Linda Roussel has a strong background in nursing administration, teaching, and consultation. She has been very instrumental in the development of a number of educational and leadership programs, including the Doctor of Nursing Practice, the Clinical Nurse Leader Role, and the Executive Nurse Administration. She's currently a professor at the University of Alabama School of Nursing. Co-author and co-presenter, Dr. Thomas, is the Director of Nursing Practice and Research at Catholic Health East, Trinity Health Legacy, in Livonia, Michigan, which is the second largest Catholic health system in the country, representing over 84 hospitals in outpatient community settings. In addition, Dr. Thomas has also held a variety of leadership positions in both practice and academia, and she's also an ANCC magnet appraiser. Both Dr. Roussel and Dr. Thomas have served in roles within the CNLA and the American Association of Colleges of Nursing. Right now, I'm going to turn it over to Tricia, and she's going to tell you a little bit about what you can expect in the presentation today. Thank you for that warm and kind introduction, Jen. Today, we actually are going to talk about the second edition of the Clinical Nurse Leader Initiating and Sustaining the CNL Role, and we've divided the presentation into two parts. Part one is going to highlight both the present and future roles of the CNL, including the value of the CNL and ensuring CNL success, the outcomes and applications, inter- and intra-professional learning, clinical leadership, clinical nurse le leader resources, and some of the measurements and outcomes that can be anticipated. In the second part of our presentation, we're going to talk about initiating and sustaining the CNL role and what is really new in the second edition. This will include how the book is organized and the content, the exemplars and reflections, new and distinct to this second edition, and an overview and highlight of chief, chief nurse executive interviews that were conducted um, as we compiled the book. So to get us started, we really wanted to talk about the evolving role of the clinical nurse leader. I think many of you can appreciate that in our present state, CNLs are focused in the areas of care coordination on their microsystems, um, functioning primarily in acute care as we know the role today. And much of their work re is residing in high reliability elements and processes. This is critically important as we begin to look at the outcomes of care and really supports their work around standardization that is grounded in evidence-based practices and the need for us to understand process to ensure outcomes. Central to the CNL role is the ability to apply methods of quality improvement and through the building of teams that are interdisciplinary in nature, they focus on quality and safety that leads to the outcomes that they're able to demonstrate on their microsystems. As we consider where we're going with the CNL role and how it is evolving as they become uh, more expert in their functions, we really need to look at accountable care and what that's going to mean. Recognizing that transitions in care and care coordination will include not only the inpatient care settings where the majority of CNLs are practicing today, it will also extend out into the community and other levels of care in long-term care facilities, ambulatory settings, and community-based clinics. All of this really helps to support the triple aim and the work that we're all doing on population health and understanding that patients receiving care in hospitals represent the highest cost and not necessarily the best outcomes. All of this really resides in the CNL's ability to promote risk anticipation, both in terms of need within a hospital setting, but equally as important, anticipating those risks before hospitalization and addressing those risks as they leave that practice setting. So one of the major elements in the CNL role as it's evolving is to understand that care will be provided across and between settings, not necessarily in a singular setting as it is today. With that, the CNL will begin to really act and interact with navigators, 
coaches and community health advisors as we begin to talk about communities and primary or uh, medical homes. As we've learned about the CNL role and the value that CNLs have in the practice setting, there are several elements that are unique and distinct to the CNL, and we wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the ways that CNLs have helped us learn and understand their value in the care delivery system. So there are several elements that we wanted to highlight today. First is the just-in-time mentoring and teaching that occurs as CNLs interact with their care team, particularly nurses, in their microsystem. Today, that typically is identified on a given nursing unit, but it is now extending into other practice settings. All of this teaching and mentoring is really grounded in evidence-based practice and outcome-driven care. One of the unique attributes of the CNL is the way that they have been educated with great focus on evidence-based practice and really translating that into common care practices on their nursing units. In addition to this, there's great recognition that the CNL role focuses on the building of teams for quality improvement irrespective of the QI philosophy that an organization might hold. This is critically important as we begin to look at processes of care, both inputs and outputs, but importantly, all the steps along the way where other members of the healthcare team are involved in accomplishing the outcomes that we anticipate for our patients. And last but not least, the clinical nurse leader has a laser focus on safety and reliability so that the care can be provided for all patients irrespective of the CNL's presence. So to summarize this slide, CNLs are doing a lot of mentoring and teaching for both novice and expert nurses as we engage in tremendous care changes in our practices. This is all grounded in evidence-based practice and outcomes through the enactment of teams that are focused on safety and high reliability. As we consider all of this, the success of the CNL really is driven by three major areas of focus. First is the integration of clinical leadership and nurses at the point of care and those responsible for the care transitions and coordinations in different practice settings. Improve patient care outcomes through stronger collaboration focused on quality, safety, and evidence-based practice. And last but not least, developing teams as a facilitator, a troubleshooter, a problem solver to enhance both team engagement and satisfaction for both employees and our patients and families. One of the things that we wanted to really call out to emphasize the work of the CNL and the resources that are available for both those in practice and academe are several key documents, the first of which is a CNL white paper developed by the American Association of Colleges of Nursing with leaders in both practice and academe back in early 2000s where the discussions around the need to prepare nurses for contemporary practice in the 21st century was identified. At that time, there was a recognition that while our nurses were graduating and very knowledgeable, they were often ill-prepared to actually practice in the contemporary environments and care delivery systems that existed. The second document that really helps to reinforce both the evolution and the development of the CNL role is the CNC job analysis. This document represents the undertaking of surveys of practicing CNLs and analyzing the work that they are presently doing in their current job and role functions. Underway is the CNL Knowledge Bank. This survey was actually distributed to CNLs across the country to identify both their socialization as CNLs in new care delivery systems as well as the outcomes and achievements they've been able to accomplish in their clinical immersions during school and in their actual practice setting upon graduation and certification. Last but not least, the CNLA is the professional organization that has been established for clinical nurse leaders. One of the exemplars in this text is actually written by Tracy Lofty, who is the chair of the Commission on Nurse Certification, responsible for the National Board Certification of Clinical Nurse Leaders. As we really talked about the clinical nurse leader role, one of the things that really became apparent 
was the integration of the Institute of Medicine competencies for the educating of healthcare professionals in the 21st century. Many of the elements that you'll notice on this slide also represent elements around the six aims of safety that were established in the IOM. First and foremost, the clinical nurse leader is patient-centered. As an advanced generalist, the clinical nurse leader is focused on patient-centered outcomes rather than organizationally-centered outcomes. All of this then is accomplished through a deep and rich implementation of evidence-based practices that are of great import both for their unit practice but equally for the outcomes of care that our patients are expected and anticipated to achieve. Within this, the clinical nurse leader is responsible for interprofessional development and the working in teams. CNLs have been prepared educationally to both identify the need for teams and to recognize the importance in bringing different disciplines together to work on the barriers, the obstacles, and the gaps in care that we see in many of our practice settings. All of this is foundationally set upon quality and process improvement, irrespective of the philosophy that an organization uh, my practice, quality and process improvement are the cornerstones for CNL's uh, achievement of the outcomes. And last but not least, the use of technology is critical. Using technology not only to um, support documentation, but equally to understand the data that is derived from the use of technology and how technology can become a great enabler of the care and service we're providing. As we talk about this emphasis on quality and safety, these are certainly not issues that are unique to nursing nor to the CNL role. All of us, irrespective of our practice setting, have had exposure to many of the landmark reports, including the Institute of Medicine reports, Healthy People 2020, the work that the IHI has done in improving clinical care outcomes, the AHRQ, and notably the CUSIN uh, Quality Safety Education for Nursing. All of these landmark reports, irrespective of their orientation, have in common the need, the desire, and the expectation that we will provide safe, effective, efficient, equitable, patient-centered, timely care. And the CNL is uniquely qualified and placed in a care delivery system to both facilitate and enhance our ability to do this. Much of this resides in our ability to manage change and to become leaders that are comfortable in navigating uncertainty. Our effectiveness is often quantified by nursing sensitive indicators. However, with increasing regulatory pressures and accreditation requirements, effectiveness is care, in care is not only measured by nursing sensitive indicators and outcomes, but by our ability in teams to accomplish outcomes that are required both for payment and the ability to demonstrate excellence in care. Efficiency has to do certainly with pay for performance, but it is really tied in our ability to quantify the cost benefit, either in our interventions, in giving up elements of care that are not evidence-based, or by investing cost to achieve outcomes that are of benefit both to the organization and our patients. And while equitable care talks about the ability to provide care consistently to all people, it also has embedded within it the ethics and the ethical principles that guide foundationally all of our professional nursing practices. Patient-centered care has become a buzz term. However, the unique attribute of the CNL in patient-centered care is to recognize when the interventions and plans that have been established, while certainly grounded in evidence, may not be individualized, and the unique elements that a CNL can bring to patient-centered care are to fully understand across the entire continuum the beliefs, the experiences, and the goals of patients to help them more readily achieve them. And last but not least, timely care. So both included in this would be patient's satisfaction with how care is delivered, but equally ensuring that the right care at the right time is delivered for every patient that is in contact with a CNL. Several of the things that we wanted to call out that is unique um, to the second edition is what we have learned about the CNL and the importance of interdisciplinary communication and collaboration skills. On this slide, you'll notice that we've highlighted several chapters that will be found in the second edition of this book, 
and we wanted to emphasize what is different uh, in this second edition when compared to our first. So one of the things that was really foundational in the first edition of this book was the development of the academic clinical partnerships. Much of that was focused on the actual curriculum plan and design and how the partnerships between the university and the um, practice setting was really uh, the essential elements in the white paper distribution and enactment. In this edition of the book, we have really called out how the academic clinical partnerships have changed as we've gained greater comfort in the curricular design of the CNL we really established that the academic clinical partnership extends beyond the acute care setting well into the community and how important this is as we move toward the outcomes that are being identified for clinical nurse leaders in transitions in care and care coordination. The second thing that we really learned in, as we've established outcomes for CNL is the importance in working in teams. In chapters five and six, we really highlighted how CNLs are leading interdisciplinary teams in their practice settings to achieve the clinical outcomes of care and the cost benefits that are being described in accountable care. Equally, the mentoring and preceptor processes that were identified in the first edition of the book centered on our ability to find a preceptor that may not be a CNL to help guide the CNL student through their immersion so that they could sit for their CNL board certification. In the second edition of this book, we really called out the mentoring preceptors that have been the true enablers of CNLs as they step out from being a novice and really become fully integrated as both advanced beginners and experts in the CNL role in various care delivery systems. And last but not least, much has been learned about leveraging CNLs in care models based on the work that we've done in our practice settings. So in Chapter 18, we've really called out how CNLs can be effectively uh, leveraged and actually integrated into existing care delivery models to really allow them to practice to the full scope of their knowledge and abilities. This visual depiction then really highlights how centrally the clinical leadership that is provided by the clinical nurse leader is then the enabling factor that allows us to achieve healthcare outcomes that serve in part as the lateral integrator between practice settings both inside our organizations and out into the community. Much of this actually occurs through coaching with both their nursing colleagues in a peer review process and equally peer to peer as CNLs have begun sharing best practices and their ability to achieve outcomes through coaching and guiding one another in fully enacting their CNL role. Much of this, too, has occurred through the mentoring, listening, and learning from their nursing colleagues as well as other members of the interdisciplinary team so that the clinical nurse leader has the ability to guide and facilitate groups toward the outcomes they're all desiring. And last but not least, the integration and the importance of leading teams that are both diverse and those that are uh, comprised only of nursing so that we're able to accomplish healthcare outcomes along the continuum. Much has been spoken about in terms of lateral integration with the CNL role. And while this was clearly a vision when the CNL white paper was written, there are several things that we've learned about the importance and the significance of the clinical nurse leader in achieving lateral integration. First and foremost, communication skills are of paramount importance. This includes both oral and verbal skills as well as written communication that enables the CNL to use tools and resources to communicate to a wide audience that is inclusive of all members of the healthcare team. With this, the ability to collaborate and to fully understand what situations require input from many people and those situations that can be accomplished with a small group. This helps the CNL accomplish the work of care coordination. Care coordination includes not only the work within a facility or in their microsystem, but the coordination of care and services that extend beyond their unit or department and into the community where much of the care is now being received. As part of risk anticipation, care coordination has taken on new importance as we've looked at ways to avoid readmissions and to identify the most appropriate 
placement for care and service that our patients and their families may need. This leads us then to the care transitions, both within a care system but equally external to the care system that may or may not be affiliated with the CNL's primary organization. As we look to patient-centered medical homes and the work of accountable care organizations, these transitions in care and the understanding of systems that is unique to the CNL in their preparation will take on even greater significance. And last but not least, the importance of ongoing evaluation. While we've been committed from the start to outcomes evaluations and decisions that are grounded in both evidence and data, the ongoing evaluation in the effectiveness of the CNL role will be critically important as this role continues to grow into the future. I'm going to now turn this over to uh, Dr. Linda Roussel so that she can finish taking us through the elements and part two of this presentation. Uh, thank you, Tricia, um, and for the wonderful uh, foundation foundational work in terms of the first chapter, then moving us into the first edition, then moving us into the second edition. Um, and as Tricia shared, uh, we have a, uh, a very intensive focus on measurement and outcomes. And while our first edition uh, had examples and exemplars from CNLs that were students and, and also beginning into the role, we know so much more. Um, about the outcomes, the, the settings that CNLs are finding themselves in, not only in the acute care setting, but there across the, con uh, uh, the continuum. And as you'll see on this slide, um, I just called out some of the exemplars that, um, that we have uh, uh, peppered uh, the entire book. Uh, with the examples, if you will, as you can see, Chapter 20, Diabetic Care, uh, Chapter 11, Dementia, dementia care, uh, Management, and again, you can see other, other exemplars, rapid response, et cetera. Just to give you some examples of uh, what these exemplars uh, uh, will look like, if you will, uh, for example, in Chapter 11 under, with glycemic control, we know that one CNL's work in her microsystem, you know, which she spread to her macrosystem, con considered the CMS uh, surgical care improvement project as skip measures. And her goal was to increase the percent of cardiac surgery patients to be at least 90% on the first and second post-op day. Um, when she did her microsystems analysis on her unit, she found that um, they were actually at 40% and doing retrospective chart reviews, interviewing, et cetera, um, she knew that this was a, a gap in an area for improvement as CMS um, set the guideline or set the goal for 90%. So in reviewing uh, the, the process uh, with her team, forming a team, uh, she actually, uh, the team actually developed a, a continuous infusion, insulin infusion project uh, presented and approved. She used the Plan Do Study Act to include education, just in time coaching of the new protocol. And after the first quarter, um, she found that not only were they adequate, they actually had achieved 90% of their patients um, at, with the um, with the glycemic control. Another example going to a, the dementia patient management, um, a CNL in his team found that 50% of their psychiatric patients on his particular unit were actually admitted with dementia and noted, noted that staff had increased injuries working with these, this patient population. Also, the patient demonstrated increased agitation and, um, and, and they averaged a 14-day length of stay. The CNL, with his, in his assessment of the microsystem and in, in assessing the root cause, developed a process to, develop, to actually trigger integration of palliative care for decision-making support so that patients actually would transfer to more appropriate settings in less time. So their average length of stay went from 14 to 10 days. Again, a really good example of, of measurement and outcomes. And then just a last example, um, you know, from the book, on falls, and again, many of the CNLs work with falls in patients, work with it across the continuum and in terms of residential. With this particular CNL, she found that falls were a common adverse event 
um, often leading to cause, which is really the leading cause of death related to injury. And 50% of their older po older adult population never regained prior functional status. So she addressed this issue um, and created a program to include calls to patients of their geriatric evaluation and management clinic 48 to 72 hours post hospitalization and had questions that actually triggered an understanding if the patient had the ability to stand, transfer, change positions in the bed, and also so in, in toilet and bathe, and if they experienced dizziness, and if there were positive responses, this triggered for further planning of home care, um, which were initiated in their daily afternoon briefings, and with the implementation of a, with the interprofessional team with this with this program in place, they actually reduced the fall 75 percent. Plus, they reduced 10 percent. They reduced their readmission rate uh, by 10 percent, and they estimated a hundred thousand dollar increase um, in turn uh, and, and hundred thousand dollar cost savings, which again. Um, is a great example of the uh, measurement and, and outcomes that you'll find in the, all of the chapters that we've identified. As we move on, we will all, you will also see, again, with the new, with what's new in the second edition, again, lots of great examples, lots of application. I've just shared just, uh, just a few. Um, as Trish has shared, the outcomes on the focus on outcomes management. Um, we expanded our evidence-based practice um, content and translation. Uh, we have a, an entire chapter that's dedicated to process improvement, improvement science, and team science. We have uh, a chapter devoted to clinical leadership and also uh, care transitions, working with health coaches, patient navigators, peer advisors, uh, community health advisors. Again, um, very strong in the focus for this edition. The organizational structure of the second edition, we actually have five units of the second edition. Uh, unit one focuses on our past, present, and future CNL cat catalyst for advancing nursing. And in this particular unit, in addition to, the, to our very um, strong history, uh, we also see where the CNL is evolving. And so future uh, impl implications is Trisha shared with not only the acute care, but care across the continuum is a focus. Unit two um, focuses on academic, clinical, and community partnerships. Um, in this particular unit, you'll find a great chapter on creating a business case. And this is real work in real time by a real chief uh, nursing executive and um, her work in creating a role for the CNL and 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 how she actually um, you know put uh, dollars to to value in looking at nursing sensitive indicators uh, team collaboration with a greater focus on effective communication collaboration coordination within micro and macro systems and CNL and nurse manager collaboration is also uh, a chapter that that is new to the uh, second edition um, Trisha shared that preparing preceptors for the CNL immersion uh, this is a new chapter with CNLs now providing uh, the, the clinical um, uh, precepting and mentoring of uh, CNL students. Unit three focuses on achieving a high reliability organizations with an increased focus on value-based care, quality care, and risk management. Um, we have an entire chapter, chapter 12, devoted to analyzing and, nav and managing data. Um, informatics and decision support in achieving CN and advancing CNL practice, as well as expanding EVP and transition and translation content. Uh, you know, as an evidence-based practice to um, to guiding CNL practice and their managing of outcomes. We also um, included, a, again, a, an entire chapter on improvement science and team science linking innovation, efficiency, and safety. Uh, unit four focuses on health promotion and disease prevention. And we expanded community resources and networks through advocacy with intense emphasis and in transformation and transition, transitioning acute specialty, long-term care, and community uh, community delivery models, um, again, with emphasis on health promotion and disease prevention, uh, considering a variety of the CNL role and, and the, a variety of the, um, of the work that CNLs do with nursing, with patient advocators, peer advisors. And lastly, Unit 
five um, provides the foundations for CNL success, describing creative and meaningful, meaningful immersion experiences, um, uh, the creation of a CNL residency program, and again, an entire chapter focused on clinical leadership and creating the vision. So as you can see from this um, slide, in terms of the organizational structure, these are some of the, the titles of the various chapters within the units with the focus that we've described. Exemplars and reflections, this is just an example of some of the exemplars um, and the examples highlighted. Um, you know, throughout, again, peppered throughout the second edition. Um, as you can see under exemplars and examples, uh, and Trish did, Trisha did speak to um, the curriculum that was the focus in the first edition, and the second edition really looks at how the academic, um, academic uh, partners have created dedicated education units, um, as well as using the information from our CNL job analysis, more on CNL certification, communication and handoffs in the ED. Um, each chapter has, has reflective uh, questions and learning activities. And again, these are just some examples of uh, formal uh, relationships between institutions that are not always possible or necessary. So what type of informal collaboration would the CNL engage in? Um, an example uh, from, from um, uh, chapter 12, um, again, using data in determining real change, designing projects, using credible measurement tools, analyzing data, you know, what tools and what um, models would the CNL use? And again, chapter 12, that, that's a good example of a learning activity. Um, we have po PowerPoint presentations also to guide the learning in addition to the exemplars, examples, the reflective questions, and the learning activities. Uh, the uh, a feature that actually uh, will be part of uh, the addendum to the um, to the, the second edition are interviews with chief nurse executives. Uh, we had the opportunity to interview five chief chief nurse executives who embraced the CNL role and actually integrated CNLs into their um, into their healthcare organizations. And we asked questions of the chief nurse executives um, about what they're thinking behind um, bringing CNLs in, um, mentoring them, uh, integrating them into the infrastructure. And so from the questions, uh, four themes evolved. Uh, the first theme was uh, the CNEs, uh, assessing the organizational culture and how important it was to know the culture's readiness for change with their internal external forces confronting the current work environment. The CNEs talked about how important it was to prepare the organization for change once you knew how ready the organization was for change. The CNEs were very clear about the importance of conceptualizing the CNL role, the skill sets with needed, um, with needed changes that were coming down the pike in terms of their own organization. Some of the, Tricia talked about the Institute of Medicine, um, the IHI, Triple Ames, the AHRQ, uh, CMS, again, all of the changes, the internal and then the external, um, the external forces that were requiring that we look at and do work differently. And how, also how important it was to um, continually assess and support and mentor clinical nurse leaders. So these were the four themes that were that that were very strongly um, bubbled up, emerged from our interviews. Um, you'll see in the next two slides um, some of the um, the actual um, uh, um, the inter from the interviews that the the chief nurse executive shared shared with us in terms of their actual quotes. So in the next two slides. Um, you'll see the um, you know, again how the C, the CNEs um, in in the first um, the first quote um, you'll see the CNE wanted see, saw the importance of the CNL in terms of um, her organization not only in terms of decreasing readmissions and improving other health um, other care outcomes she also saw this as uh, wanting this to be her legacy. Um, CNLs are critical primary, nurse, primary nurses interacting with patients. Um, the new role may have functional worth for specific tasks. However, the CNL's understanding of complexity, 
collaboration, team building, as we talked about, um, promoting seamless care, um, again, providing leadership. And, and also the ability for the CNL to mentor and to be that clinical, clinical leader at the bedside in care transition and then a care across the continuum continue to be you know, underscored with the CNL as coach, as facilitator, as mentor, and as, as the change agent as health care changes. And as you can see from the next slide, again, just really uh, um, the, the rich um, the rich conversations um, that the uh, that the nurse executives um, uh, shared with us as the CNL is in just in time, the nurses nurse. Um, it, I was also struck with one of the CNE's uh, comments about while the evidence is strong for all RN staff mix, that the bottom line is that we can no longer afford to do this as, and be physically responsible. So the CNL, as an advanced generalist with critical thinking skills and the skill set to build teams, um, to translate evidence into best practices, to, to look at outcomes, to be sensitive, and to be very savvy in terms of um, the financial modeling and improving and in saving costs and also improving patient experiences um, were, was critical in terms of um, the future work environment, if you will. And also, um, the hard work these CNEs, these chief nurse executives, um, had to do uh, in really understanding and analyzing their own work environments and evaluating their, their staff mix, again, as part of that readiness for change, but also knowing, you know, what was absolutely critical to their survival and also um, their patient outcomes and being, again, fiscally responsible and um, in, in promoting health care for, uh, for their organizations and also for their community. And again, seeing the absence of a CNL um, really causing some panic because of, again, the CNLs being so embedded. So again, this just gives you just a flavor, if you will, of some of the chief nurse executives' feedback in, in terms of really embracing the CNL. So we really wanted to include um, the, the real time and the, the, the real experiences that the chief nurse executives are having with the um, implementation you know, of the role and really wanting it to be part of the infrastructure and not to be layered on top of um, where CNLs are vulnerable. So I, I, I believe this really gives you some uh, really good feedback in the sense of, of, of all the content that we're covering and how this really um, goes to the end of what we're really wanting to accomplish and the CNLs are, um, are really charged to do with their experience, their immersion experience, and their educational um, background. Uh, as you can see from the next slide, um, the importance of the second addition to nursing practice and education, as Trisha shared, this was a, this was a joint um, venture, if you will, with the academic and the practice partnership. So the focus on quality and safety to improving care delivery, coordination, collaboration, and again, care across the continuum. Uh, reinforcing the critical work of engaging patients and engaging staff and also in managing outcomes and in considering major healthcare agendas, including the Institute of Medicine, uh, future of nursing, as well as uh, keeping patients safe, the educating healthcare professionals in the 21st century. Trish talked about that in terms of patient centered care, um, uh, working in teams, the use of evidence, quality improvement, and informatics, and also Healthy People 2020 and the IHI triple aims of population based care. Um, it being very sensitive to the patient experience as well as reducing uh, co costs uh, per capita, uh, cost per patient care, or at least um, uh, neutralizing it. So, and uh, as we continue um, with our presentation, uh, lastly, our resources um, that, that we've used, and Tricia shared um, the resources that we use with the AACN. Uh, uh, white paper, the job analysis. Um, we have a link to the CNL Association, um, as well as the Master's Essentials, which uh, were integrated, you know, into the CNL curriculum and, and also um, discussed, you know, within the second 
uh, edition. I, I will turn it over to Jennifer. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to share with you um, our um, the work that we've done and also um, the, uh, the the feedback that we hope to get as you use the, the book and, and give us information that will be helpful to us in further developing the clinical nurse leader role. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Linda, and a big thank you as well to uh, Tricia for this wonderful presentation and for imparting all of this relevant knowledge. And I want to thank you, the listeners, for your time today. And we hope that you learned a great deal about the clinical nurse leader role and its evolution. And the second edition of the text will be available in July, so please look for that. You can contact your sales rep, or if you wish to place an order right now for a review copy, you can go to the URL that you see on the slide. That's go.jblearning.com forward slash CNL. And on this slide, as Linda mentioned, you'll also uh, find additional information on a variety of resources that were mentioned during the presentation. So please make note of these URLs, and hopefully they will um, provide you the information that you've been looking for. And on behalf of everyone at Jones and Bartlett Learning, we do want to thank you for your participation and appreciate your taking the time uh, to be on this recording with us today. Thank you.